Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us today. Today is the 4th of June, and <clears throat> this is uh, Parashat Badmid Bar, which simply means in the wilderness. And today we're going to talk about does Hashem ordain suffering? So the Torah portion for this week comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 20. In Hebrew, the book of Numbers is called Bad Midbar. And the prophetic portion, the Haftarah, comes from the book of Hosea, chapter 1, verse 10, through chapter 2, verse 20. And in the Hebrew Bibles, it's actually chapter 2, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 22. <clears throat> so they're slightly different. The Brit Harashah, or the New Testament, comes from Luke, chapter 16, verse 1, through chapter 17, verse 10. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 7, and 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 20. So my name is uh, Rabbi Luke, uh, Rabbi Luke, that's a good one, Rabbi Harel Clint Fry, <laughs> and um, and just uh, thank you for joining us today. So before we start, I would just like to open up in prayer. So Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time that we get to be in your presence to study your word, and to understand more about you. As we know, you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Your ways never change. You just teach us more and more about who you are and your love for us. So I thank you for this time. I ask that you speak through us, through your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So, uh, last week in Parasha Bechukotai, which means by my decrees, we read that the agricultural land in Israel was to have a rest every seven years. And as I've said before, it's not a bad idea to do anywhere you live, no matter what country you live in. Because that it, it is applicable anywhere you go. It's, Hashem is going to bless you if, you if you plant this way. And I am... <clears throat> A true witness of this, like I said, through um, one of my farmer friends out in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, who did the same thing. He was planting, as everybody else did, crop rotation failing miserably. He decided to try it the way Hashem said, plant six years, let it seven rest for seven. And he had 10 times the normal crops that he should have had, even if he had a, a good crop. So Hashem's ways, as I said, bring blessings to our lives. And they're very good to follow. Like I said, they don't bring salvation. We cannot follow all the commandments of the Bible and be saved. But they do bring salvation. They're, or they do bring uh, blessing. And hey, if he says these are my 10 commandments, first of all, we need to follow them. Granted, we've all at least broken one or two, if not more. But what do we do when we do that? We repent. We, we, we turn from our ways. But these things that the Hashem has given us to follow or simply um, the Ten Commandments are Ten Commandments. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And yes, they are to be followed. Especially if we are believers in Yeshua, we should have the desire to follow these things. Okay. But even the law of Moses itself is it's not a law. It's They're called um, the Torah, which means instructions. That's what they are, instructions on how to live. So they bring blessings to our lives so as i said <clears throat> we let the land rest for seven six years let it rest for the seventh year then we read about the jubilee which the jubilee year which will actually be the year between september 2022 and september 2023 okay so this coming rosh hashanah will begin the jubilee year which is the 50th year this followed seven cycles of seven years so 49 years then the 50th year is a year of Jubilee, which, like I said, will be next, this coming uh, Rosh Hashanah. So the Israelites were released of their debts, and they could, could return to their inherited lands. Also, the, the, the slaves are freed, etc., etc. So this week's parasha studies the opening chapters of the book of Bad Midbar, or Numbers. And like I said, Bad Midbar means in the wilderness or the desert. Now, the Hebrew name for the book of Numbers comes from the fifth word of the opening line of Numbers. Okay, it is 
the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent meeting in the desert, Badmi Bar of Sinai. Numbers chapter one, verse one. <clears throat> so I would also like to open up by speaking about El Shaddai and what is actually in a name. <clears throat> so it says, take a census of the whole Israelite community by their clans and families, listing every man by name. Numbers chapter one, verse two. Now remember, Hashem would not allow census to be taken of his holy people. If that happened, people would die. But if he, if he called for the census, it was okay to do. So here we have a time, one of the few times when we are told to take a census of all the men. And in Numbers chapter one, Moshe or Moses is commanded to take a census of all the adult males. They are numbered according to the family and name by their father's houses. <clears throat> so in Jewish tradition, names carried significant meaning. They still do. Okay. And even many of our names nowadays in, in English, if you go back and look at them, they have incredible meanings that come from a long time ago. So, for example, example, the name Elitzur or Eliazar in number numbers chapter one, verse five means by God, or Eli is or my God, Eli is a rock. Tzur, Eli Tzur. Okay, so my God is a rock. Of the 12 men who were meant to assist Moses and Aaron in taking the census, nine of them contained the divine name of El or God. In their own names okay so there are three of their names contained zur which means rock which is often used for hashem as in zur israel the rock of israel or we could also call it rock of ages numbers chapter 1 verses 6 through 15. so the name shaddai for example is a very revealing word study it also appears three times in the names of different men, okay? So the compound of El Shaddai is usually translated as God Almighty. El Shaddai means, Shaddai means Almighty in the English Bibles. <clears throat> but this, unfortunately, this label does not even really begin to do justice to the actual meaning of this name, one of these names of Hashem. So it says in Genesis chapter one or chapter seven, verses one, when Abraham or Abram was 90 years or 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God almighty, El Shaddai, walk before me and be blameless. Now Shaddai comes from a Hebrew word, root word Shaddad, which means to overpower. So interestingly enough, this root can also mean a demonic power, for example. El Shaddai also means that God overpowers or prevails against all demonic powers. Okay, so that is another meaning of El Shaddai. It says in Isaiah 13, 6, wait for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty or Shaddai. So Shaddai also comes from a Hebrew word root uh, Shad, which means breast. Okay, Shad, Shaddai, breast. This reveals kind of also the maternal and the merciful nature of Hashem. So if we read the word carefully, the Bible, we will see this aspect of Hashem's nature as Shaddai, the woman's breast, the source of nourishment and comfort to her children. <clears throat> so uh, it says in Genesis chapter 49, verse 25, because of the Almighty or Shaddai, who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast, that is Shadim, and the womb. So we know from the book of Genesis that we were created in Hashem's image as male and female, okay? We were not created as anything else. There might be some people who are born with uh, both um, both sexes and they're, they're specific type of people, um, but there are no such thing as trans or anything else or... <clears throat> You know, this other weird stuff that's coming out these days is simple, evil, satanic attack on what Hashem created. 
So as strange as it may seem to us, <clears throat> Hashem is not only a father, he is also a mother. And there's one movie I really enjoyed, one book actually, and it was turned into a movie called The Shack. Now, some people say that's extremely sacrilegious and this and that, it's not biblical, but there are many beautiful things in that movie we can take from it that are really cool. And one of the things is the father. God the father is portrayed as a woman in this book. It shows this aspect of him. Okay, I'm not saying he's a woman. I'm saying he, he created us man as woman. That means he's God. He has everything in him, all right? Who's to say who he is? We know he's a father. We know we refer to him as he, but he has also the, the, the traits since he created them and we created us in his image, right? So <clears throat> he has many names in the Tanakh or the Old Testament. He is our rock. He's our provider and much more. I mean, there, if you think about it, his names are infinite. We probably don't even, can't even imagine all of his names that he has, but he is everything we need. That's what we need to know. He is everything we need. We don't need anything else. And trust me, in the times that are coming, we're already seeing the effects of the one of the four horsemen being released. Okay, we have major drought and lack of crops. Hello, that's one of the four horsemen. So when we rely completely on him, we might end up being in a place where he might bring us uh, locusts and honey or, or meat and bread from ravens. <laughs> Who knows what he will do to provide. He might allow our food supplies, what we have in our house, what little bit of flour and what else we have, rice and whatever else we might have in our house to completely self-multiply like he did for the widow who had the, <clears throat> the jars of the flour and they never ran out or the jars of oil. So let's remember that he is everything we need. and We need to completely trust and lean into him. So the fact that he is everything we need was proven <clears throat> when Moses asked Hashem for his true name, for example. Hashem answered, Aye Asher Aye, which commonly translated as I am who I am, is actually really translated as I will be what I will be. Okay, this kind of covers everything, right? Not I am who I am now. I will be what I will be. In other words, hey, I am, I will be what I'll be now and in the future. Exodus 3.14 speaks of this. So in this one name alone, <clears throat> we can call on Al Shaddai to be our comforter, nurturer, and savior. So it says that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. I always love that. I always mention the, the big, huge tower, one that can't be destroyed by, uh, by hands or by armament like ours can. And it says the righteous run to it and are safe. Proverbs 18.10. <clears throat> So let's talk about now what the Haftarah portion, the prophetic portion is. So in today's parasha and the Haftarah, they share the themes of wilderness and numbering Israel, the Israelites. In the parasha, Moses takes the census. And in the Haftarah, the prophetic portion, Hashem promises that the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. This is found in Hosea 1.10. And it's... <clears throat> Hosea chapter 2, verse 1 in the Hebrew text. So in Genesis 15, 5, also Hashem also likens the numbers of Israel to the stars, right? He's speaking to Abraham. He took him outside and said, <clears throat> look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. <clears throat> so our main theme today, as I said in the beginning, can suffering be ordained by Hashem? Can it be ordained by Hashem? <clears throat> the Haftarah, the prophetic portion, promises that Hashem will allure Israel, that is, bring her back to the land, which is what he's doing now, and that the relationship between Hashem and Israel would be, once again, like a healthy marriage. Obviously, it won't happen until Yeshua comes back, the completely healthy marriage, but he's working on it. It says in Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, Therefore, I am now going to allure her. <clears throat> I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. 
There I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Akor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, youth as in the day she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. <clears throat> so to understand the themes of marriage, for example, betrayal and redemption in Hosea, we need to understand Hosea's situation. It's always <clears throat> really got me, this book. Hashem instructed Hosea to take a harlot, a prostitute, <clears throat> any other words can be used which aren't so nice, for a wife, a woman who was seemingly destined to be unfaithful to him. All right, he knew he would not be faithful. She would not be faithful. So the rabbis, in fact, believe that Hosea's resulting domestic tragedy was actually ordained by Hashem. Hey, Hashem told him, you need to marry this woman. Hashem can tell us to do really weird things that would make absolutely no sense. And many people will say, well, that's not biblical. Oh, that's not written in the Bible. Well, guess what? If Hashem tells you to do something, he can supersede what he wrote in the book, okay? <clears throat> so, for example, the rabbis, uh, the priests at that time were not al allowed to marry a divorced woman or <clears throat> any other type of sexually impure woman, like a prostitute even. All right, they couldn't even marry um, a, um, a widow. So, <clears throat> Through his personal ordeal and the antagonizing, antagonizing pain, I imagine, he would have of loving a woman who would turn to other men, Hosea came to understand a very deep level of how Hashem feels about Israel, his unfaithful bride. <clears throat> you still see it today. Many people are very unfaithful. They don't even acknowledge that there is a God. <clears throat> Some say they don't need God. I've had people tell me that. But you will deal with those people. It says in Hosea 3.1, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and as an, is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites. So they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Nothing wrong with raisin cakes. I mean, Israelites <clears throat> ate raisin cakes all the time, but they these were raisin cakes that were sacred and offered to other gods. <clears throat> now I've seen a movie about Hosea and Gomer. And there's one part where she goes off to another man and lives with him or does other things. She's basically sold, <clears throat> trying to be sold as a slave in the end because she does not please this man. Well, Hashem tells Hosea, go get her. So she, he goes to the slave market and he offers an exorbitant amount of money to get his wife back while she's up there on this platform, reduced to <clears throat> filth, completely disheveled, disheveled, whatever you call the word. And she doesn't even look like her. She's not the beautiful woman she was, at least up on that, that little platform. But he pays the money for her. He picks her up and he takes her home. And there she understands what true love is. <clears throat> so this will happen in the end times. Hashem might actually take us through periods of suffering, even anguish of heart, soul, and body, not only to identify with Hashem's pain over sin, <clears throat> but also so that we may identify with the pain of other people. So this is kind of a hard concept to understand, I'm sure, for many, that Hashem may actually ordain personal suffering. <clears throat> He's allowed me to go through it, you to say he won't again. I hope not. But still, how can we truly minister to the suffering, lost, broken, despairing, hopeless, confused, depressed, sick, poor, trapped, homeless, drug addict, alcohol, sexually addicted, et cetera, et cetera, whatever you want to call it. How can he help us? Those who have been in prison, for example, hurting humanity, unless we also have experienced some of these painful states of, of, of the soul <clears throat> and physical actual states. So I know that he allows us to go through these things. Same thing with Job. Think about it. Job didn't do anything wrong, but yet Hashem allowed him to have everything taken from him except for his main house and his wife who kept telling him curse the name of the Lord and be killed. 
Who needs a friend like that, right? But hey, he allowed him to have those things. Everything else was taken from him. Hashem ordained it. So sometimes we are burdened beyond measure, beyond our strength. And we are burdened to the point that we despise life itself. We hate life. People will commit suicide over this stuff. Sad. <clears throat> but Hashem gives us his comfort to ease our burdens and those of the suffering world. So it says in 2 Corinthians 1.4, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. <clears throat> there it has it right there. So what does it mean to find strength in the storm? Because we're going to have many storms in life, <clears throat> like the Sea of Galilee. If you go there, it's a small sea. You could call it a huge lake or a very small sea. I mean, you can actually look across and see the other side. But yet many very violent storms came upon that sea. <clears throat> Same thing in our lives. All right. So. My question is, are you burdened and grieved by some kind of maybe a domestic tragedy like Hosea's <clears throat> adulterous spouse? All right. Is it beyond your ability to bear? Do you struggle with despair over a situation in your home or family that never seems to be resolved? One thing I can tell you is praise the Lord for it. Like I read in the book, two books actually by a man named Merlin Carruthers. One, the first one was called Prison to Praise, but it gave his specific testimony of his life <clears throat> how he was saved and how he learned to praise Hashem the Lord for all things good and bad specifically naming that thing also another book that followed that called power and praise which is because a continuation of speaking about what praise can do in our lives so when we're going through these storms the only way to can get through people I'm telling you this right now as a personal experience praise him for it so sometimes, <clears throat> like I said, we may feel like we live in a never-ending storm. We might even begin to doubt whether Hashem loves us. It's like, what's going on here? Have you turned your back on me? He hasn't. The Bible records that the, even the disciples of Yeshua, Jesus, were once in such a storm, on the a storm of hurricane proportions, basically, from what I understand. Like you said, on the Sea of Galilee, their boat was filling with water <clears throat> and they were sinking pretty quickly. They thought they would, were going to drown for sure. So what do we know? Where was Yeshua during this time? He was sleeping on the stern of the boat and at the bottom of the boat. In their distress, the disciples cried out, <clears throat> Master, don't you care that we are dying or perishing? This is found in Mark chapter 4, verse 37, 38. So what was Yeshua's answer? Do you still have no faith? Mark chapter 4, verse 40. So there are times when we feel like we're drowning. It seems like Hashem is sleeping. We wonder if he can even cares anymore about us. What's going on? <clears throat> Especially when we cry out to him constantly, help me, help me, help me. And it's like nothing happens. Sometimes you might even feel that the Holy Spirit has even left you. I've had that feeling too. But I didn't realize he was off preparing something, preparing the way for me to have my salvation through a very interesting uh, <clears throat> uh, event in my life. He had an enemy. He was just preparing something to save me and to help me. So why does Hashem allow us, our storms, to go on and on? Sometimes they can end quickly. Sometimes they seem like they go on forever. Like I said, we have prayed, maybe even fasted, prayed some more, <clears throat> begged some more. But the wind and waves continue to beat against our tiny sinking boat. The storm just keeps going on. But by understanding how Hashem healed Hosea's turmoil, <clears throat> we can know for sure that our storm-tossed soul will find rest eventually. Hosea was deeply unhappy in his marriage. He was not happy. He probably wanted to let her go when she left again. I'd say, okay, fine, get out of here. He had seemingly wasted his love on this woman, Gomer, a promiscuous, adulterous woman. 
Nevertheless, his marriage symbolized the Shem's experience with the nation of Israel. So like Hosea, Hashem is a loving, faithful husband who has a band who, who was abandoned and betrayed by a wife. Hashem chose Israel, delivered her from Egypt, to be his own special segula or treasure. The Jewish people suffered as slaves in Egypt. He delivered them. He showered them with blessings. He showed great miracles, lavished them with love, gave them their own home, a land flowing with milk and honey, <clears throat> which is a wedding gift. All right, an Israeli wedding gift is milk and honey. And he made them into a mighty people. Yet, in complete ingratitude, they adopted the customs and worship of the idolaters, Canaanites, and other people in those land. And they forsook their one true God. Even after he told them constantly, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. This will happen to you if you do this and that. I will <clears throat> do this. He warned them many times of what would happen to them, but they still did it. So they forsook their one true God, the creator of the heaven and earth and their redeemer. We often, we often live like Israel and Gomer lived. In rebellion, unfaithfulness to our El Shaddai. But Gomer had a destiny to fulfill, and so do we. Strangely enough, she fulfilled a great destiny. <clears throat> the name Gomer, and I'm not talking about Gomer Pyle, the guy who used to be in this weird show back in the... 60s and 70s, it comes from the Hebrew root, root word gamar, which means to complete, to perfect, and to finish. Imagine. So when Gomer finally realized that the gifts of her worldly suitors could not compare with fulfilling Hashem's purpose for her, <coughs> being a wife to Hosea and a mother to his children, Hashem sent Hosea to redeem her from being sold as a slave. So because of his great mercy, Hashem has redeemed us from our slavery of our own unfaithfulness and rebellion to him. He has given us a hope and a future through Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, <clears throat> our Redeemer, who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. This is found in Isaiah 53, 5. So because Hashem has paid the price of redemption for us, we can trust him to perfect that which concerns us. It says in Psalm 138, 8, because Hashem has paid the price of redemption for us, we can trust him to, to perfect that which concerns us. So, <clears throat> the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. <clears throat> so, just like Hosea, as a husband, would not give up on Gomer. Well, Hashem told him to go get her. But Hashem will not give up on Israel because his people also have a destiny to fulfill yet. So those of you who like to say, well, God has rejected Israel, this and that. Well, the fact that there are Messianic Jews means that he has not rejected us. He never will. In fact, he will reject, he will take out the branch of those who have been uh, implanted into the main branch, those who decide they want to be against Israel or speak badly or have a bad attitude. All right. It's not okay. And he can, just as he put the branch in, all right, he can take it out. <clears throat> and that's what he says also in Matthew. So just like I said, we have a destiny to fulfill yet. It says, they will be called the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called sought after the city no longer deserted. <clears throat> this is found in Isaiah 62, 12. <clears throat> So just like a mother's love draws her children near to her, El Shaddai is drawing his children to him through his love. So if we look at the beautiful imagery that reflects the gentle, merciful, long-suffering, ever-faithful, loving nature of Hashem in the following passages of <clears throat> Hosea 11, 3 through 4, it says, It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them, I was like the one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. <clears throat> and it says in Hosea 11, 8, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. 
So <clears throat> in fulfillment of Bible prophecy, Hashem brought the Jewish people back to the wilderness that was the land of Israel. He has made that wilderness blossom again. He is still alluring and speaking to his people, just like Hosea prophesied, until their destiny actually is fulfilled. <clears throat> so in conclusion, I'd like to speak about something very interesting. The fact that the world was created for me. <clears throat> so there's a census report that makes for difficult reading. Working through the details of tribal and family tallies can be an exercise in monotony. If you look, if you read some of these, you're like, okay, what does it matter? What's and what's his name from the tribe of blah, blah, blah. It's important. It's not fun reading, but it's important. The Rabbi Rashi found this very sweet message about Hashem's love that underlied the dry census data. Okay. He explained that Hashem enjoyed counting the Israelites because of his special affection for each person. <clears throat> So according to his interpretation, the census is a reminder that the children of Israel are not just a collective whole, all right, like society likes to make us think we're just a number, okay, or a code, or a barcode, or whatever. Israel is a nation composed of individuals, just like the rest of the world is, a, is individuals. We are individuals, all right? So all the people of Hashem are real people. Moshe and Aaron... Moses and Aaron counted them according to their genealogical registration by their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names, head by head. <clears throat> Numbers 120. So this method gave every Israelite the opportunity to tell his name and to be counted as an individual of worth. <clears throat> Each person is valuable and unique. They are a special treasure or sigula to Hashem. So in the Talmud, which is we don't follow... Uh, but there's a discussion about Adam, the first man and father of all humanity. Why does all of humanity descend from a single human being or two human beings? To, each, to teach you that whoever destroys a single person <clears throat> is regarded as if he had destroyed an entire world of people. And whoever saves a single person is regarded as, through, as though he had saved an entire world. So if you think about all those people who saved Jews, for example, during the Holocaust, what did they do? They allowed future generations of that family to continue to survive. And many times, just one person out of a whole family was often saved. Sometimes entire families were wiped out. Don't know why, but many times there was at least one person that survived the Holocaust. <clears throat> this is just an example. The meaning of this teaching is that each person is as valuable as Adam, who is the first man. So uh, even though Adam was only a single human being, he held within him, within him the potential of all humanity, right? So too, each person shares that same potential. <clears throat> no person should be dismissed as simply a number or a cog in the wheel, as, like I said, our society likes to say now. Governments, they assign us a number, you're just a number. Well, don't worry, Hashem is going to put them all on their knees and destroy each and every one. That would be great. So, why? Besides the underlying sin that we're seeing these days happen in all the nations of the world, but also because of the fact that they want to reduce each and every person who Hashem created to be nothing else but that. This can be one of the many reasons. Every human being <clears throat> is a whole world. So the same Talmudic discussion points out that every person, regardless of race, is part of the same human family. We all came from Adam. Okay. Adam was created for the sake of peace among men, <clears throat> so that no one can say to his fellow, my father was greater than yours. We all have Adam as our common father. The same discussion points out that while we all come from the same from the same prototype, we are also actually unique individuals. Look at how many differences there are in humanity now compared to, I'm sure, at that time, right? The two people. And they were pretty dark skinned. So they were the color of the earth, which is why they called Adam. So Adam was created to demonstrate the greatness, the greatness of the Holy One. <clears throat> if a smith 
a metalsmith strikes many coins from one mold, they all look the same, right? Yet the most high king of kings, the holy one, fashioned every man in the image of the first man. <clears throat> Yet not one of them is identical to any of anybody else. Therefore, every person is obliged to say the world was created for my sake. This comes from the book of the Sanhedrin. So Yeshua told the parable also <clears throat> about a shepherd who noticed that one of his hundred sheep was missing. A 1% loss is not a terribly serious thing nowadays, it seems like, but this particular shepherd <clears throat> had special affection and concern for every sheep in the flock. He left the 99, went out seeking that one lost sheep, rejoicing when he found it and carried it on his shoulders back to the rest of the flock. This is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. This should help us understand <clears throat> his love for us, Yeshua's love for us, and the Father's love for us. So from Hashem's perspective, we are not nameless, faceless crowd of people. Each person is unique, special, and beloved. When Yeshua died on that cross for our sins, guess what? He thought about every single person that had ever lived, who lived at the time, and who would ever live in the future up until the time of his return, individually you think oh how's that possible hey he's god right yeshua is the son of god and he's god all things are possible he has no time frame he knows everything from the beginning to the end so guess what he thought of every single person when he died on that cross he thought about me he thought about you by name <clears throat> and trust me if we were the only people alive on the place on the face of this planet at that time he would have done it just the same for you that's the truth so Hashem cares for you personally he is concerned with your concerns and he seeks your well-being so yes even if he does allow suffering or even ordain it he's doing it for a reason <clears throat> okay he allowed me to go through my sufferings for a reason to teach me many many things but above all, to teach me his love, his provision, and even his humor. He taught me many things about himself. So it's so beautiful to see his hand in our lives when we are going through the suffering, when we call upon him, and when we open our eyes to what's around us, what's going on. And if we praise him for what's going on, even on a daily basis, if something comes up during that time of suffering, praise him for it you'll see mighty things happening in your life. Trust me. I am a living witness to this, a living testimony. Not easy. Many people fail <clears throat> to praise him for all things. But it is a commandment to do so. Okay, it's a command to praise him in all things, to thank him for all things, good and bad. Because as the Bible says, he will work all things out for the good of those who love him and are called according to, per, to his purpose. <clears throat> so whatever we're going through now, in the future, we can't see what the good is going to come, but he will cause it to be good. To teach us something, to bless others, to whatever it's going to be, but it's going to be good. Okay. Let me think about this time on this earth is so temporary. I'm 53 years old. It seems like yesterday I was 18 and 19, 20. You know, it really does. It seems like yesterday. I'm not old yet, but I'm getting there. But our life goes quickly. I think about my parents are only about 20 years. My father's 22 years older than I am. My mother's about 20 or uh, maybe 19 years older than I am. You know, they're in their 70s. Thinking, wow, in just 20 years, I'm going to be that age. It doesn't take long for our lives to pass before us before we reach eternity. So what we go through here is simply to get us prepared for that. Eternity will never stop. And that's a beautiful thing for those who are saved. <clears throat> for those who aren't, it won't be so great. But he is trying to teach us something while we're here. So if those of you who would like to accept Yeshua as your Moshiach, as your Savior, and as the Bible says, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. Those who believe in me will be saved, is what he says. Saved from eternal damnation. So now... 
it's your time to take that step. If you so desire to, you are the sole <clears throat> proprietor, decider of your eternal life or death. Nobody else can do that but you. Hashem doesn't choose it for you. No rabbi has a right to choose it for you. You do. If you're going to allow a man, a rabbi, or any or anybody out there on the face of this earth to choose for you your destination, your eternal destination, that's a foolish thing to do. <clears throat> you have every right to say, hey, I want to believe in Yeshua. It says in the Bible that if I believe in him, I'll be saved. That's it. So I want to invite you now to take that step. It's a simple prayer. But if you say it with your heart, with all your heart and your soul, and you believe it, <clears throat> you'll be saved. Baruch Ataya Adonai Elohim Melech Olam, Asher Natan Lanu Eterech Yeshua BeMashiach Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah Yeshua. It's so beautiful. If you have said this prayer for the first time in your life, really meant it. Believe it. I ask you to contact us. Don't put it in the comments. That's that's between you and us, <clears throat> you and Hashem. There is a link below for to contact us, and we'll send you something for free. Uh, if you need help in any way, there is a Macha Seishel Tikva link for the Rebbe Tzin Gabriela. She is a licensed counselor <clears throat> based on biblical-based things, not what the world is showing about other strange things, but the uh, there is that counseling uh, opportunity. <clears throat> if you'd like to just contact us for anything, there's a contact link below. And if you'd like to help us donate, make a donation to help us continue with our ministry, we thank you for that. We cannot do it without you. <clears throat> this ministry is completely, um, we do not ask for any money for any of our um, resources that we put on our website. For any teachings, we do not ask. If it's Something you want to do out of your heart, that's one thing. If not, I ask you to be blessed. There is a link for that also. There's a link with all of our Messianic resources. Like I said, for free, they're all on our website. Everything's there for you to take, download, to print. May you be blessed by it. We've worked hard and many, many years to create many of these things. So we hope you enjoy them. We did our best we could possibly do for you. And if you'd like to dedicate also a parashat to somebody or a special event that's coming up, please let us know. There's a link for that also to contact us and we can do that for you. So I hope you've been blessed by this time together <clears throat> as I have. I've, I've learned a lot. I just want to bless you now. <laughs> Yae Adonai Pana Belecha Mehuneka Isa Adonai Pana Belecha Besehem Lecha Besehem Lecha Shalom Beshem Yeshua Hamashiach Sarha Shalom Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, Shalom and Shabbat Shalom to all of you.